let me uh, just recall where we were last time and then uh, open up to questions and various announcements. So we're talking about, broadly speaking, the Electron Hubbard model, which is written up there. Uh, and we're going to explore the large U region, uh, hopefully, uh, today. But right now, we're still talking about the Fermi liquid regime, which is present uh, at very small U and generic density. Uh, and we introduced uh, Landau's Fermi liquid theory, uh, which is a way of understanding uh, an interacting electron gas, at least at weak interactions, hopefully maybe even at strong interactions by some process of continuity from the free electron gas. So we introduced the idea of a quasi-particle, which is some adiabatic uh, extension of a free particle, um, and also postulated that we can think of the ground state of the interacting electron gas uh, as a system with, uh, uh, so let's see, I'm, I hope you're seeing the board. <laughs> you have to change the focus. Uh, so you have to think of uh, uh, the ground state as having uh, quasi-particles present. This is the distribution of quasi-particles in the ground state N0 of P uh, all the way up to the Fermi moment. And then any given state as you perturb the system, uh, the distribution will be given by the pink line N of P, and the difference is delta N of P. Uh, and then given a collection of quasi-particles with some distribution, its energy depends on two terms. There's the uh, ordinary term that's present even for free electrons uh, with some dispersion EP, uh, and EP goes to zero on the Fermi surface. And then there's an interaction roughly a mean field type interaction where the density of quasi-particles um, uh, dependent upon the interaction uh, on the product of the density of quasi-particles. So one consequence is that if, I, if you compute this, uh, which is roughly the change in energy for adding a quasi-particle, we call it EV star. Of course, that's just the bare energy of quasi-particles, but it also has a correction. This is the Landau uh, correction which depends on the density of all the other quasi-particles that may be present. All right. So uh, last time there was a question I deferred on uh, zero sound. So let me uh, say a little bit about that. So this whole formalism is all set up to describe the response uh, of the system to any weak uh, perturbation. So let's imagine we apply some potential, uh, some potential energy by maybe by a capacitor plate or something, uh, which I'll just write as V of R and T. So there's some space dependent potential uh, and also time dependent potential in principle. Um, and this is going to act on the system. And I'm going to take a classical point of view, sort of a WKB point of view, that if this is slowly varying, both in space and time, I can just think of that as an addition to the quasi particle energy. Uh, and this will be valid provided it turns out to be slowly varying on the scale of the spacing between the particles, uh, Fermi wave vector, um, and some time scale, which is the Fermi energy, which you know, are uh, very short time scales in distances. So it's quite easy to, uh, this is a generally a very good approximation. Okay. So given this, then even the quasi particle energy becomes a you know, position. Uh, uh, at time, uh, as does the distribution function. Uh, it depends upon R and T also. Uh, and now you have to solve some equation of motion to determine uh, delta N of R of K and T given some V of R and T. Uh, and that equation of motion is essentially the Boltzmann equation uh, written for quantum particles. Um, so on the average, you can just use, you know, a Hamilton's <coughs> equation of motion. So if you have the average position of a quasi-particle, uh, well, it's going to obey, uh, you know, d e p star e t. Oh, sorry, d p. Yes, and then d p. To put the momentum of a quasi-particle will change the time. Uh, as minus d e p star e r. So these are the usual classical equations of motion. 
uh, which would apply for sufficiently slowly varying potentials and distribution functions. And then this leads to um, the Boltzmann equation, which is essentially that D delta N dt plus you know, dr, just you could think of this as just the chain rule of differentiation, delta n delta r plus uh, dp dt delta, 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 n, delta r, uh, sorry, t. <laughs> Um, and then all the all the cheating and all the things that we haven't accounted for we put on the right hand side uh, typically is called the collision term. So the essence of, of I mean, and this collision term involves other processes with scattered quasi particles across the Fermi surface, which can happen at low energies and really the validity of this whole formulation depends upon this collision term being very small. Uh, so the collision time between quasi particles being very long. And that's the question we're going to investigate today in some more detail. Um, but if you replace this by zero, that's a, essentially what you get from the liquid theory. And you know, I could spend several lectures now solving these equations on the board while ignoring the right hand side uh, and looking at the responsible Fermi liquid. Uh, to various external perturbations. Uh, there's a couple of calculations and notes. I'm sure you can find others in many other textbooks. Uh, and one of the things you'll find uh, that there is one of the excitations you'll discover by solving these equations uh, is in fact the zero sum mode. You'll find that there is a uh, um, kind of a mode that can propagate to the system. Uh, and you can just think of it uh, as some kind of oscillation of the Fermi surface, uh, which propagates in some direction in space. Um, so, you know, Fermi surface here, uh, and as it, uh, in this region of space, and then somewhere over there, it oscillates in some way that preserves the total volume. Uh, and these slow oscillations of the Fermi surface are what correspond to the zero sum mode. And the, those you can get by solving these equations. Yes. Can you clarify how you should think of this delta n being a function both of momentum and position? Uh, yeah, well, so uh, it's the usual uh, WKB type decomposition um, that you have. Uh, if you want to do it in terms of Green's functions, uh, then you have a Green's function that depends in a non equilibrium, say, on two times. Uh, then you have the dependence on, uh, well, let's in position, it depends on two positions. And then you have the average position, the center of mass position, and the difference. And the momentum is the Fourier transform of the difference of the positions. Uh, and the position is really the average position of the two uh, operators in your brain's function. But when you wrote the delta n function of r, k, and t. Right. Um, so the r dependence is entirely coming from the external perturbation. It's going to come from the solution of these equations. If V is independent of R, then delta L will not depend on R. So it's just going to come from solving this differential equation, not for anywhere else. Should we think of K as the large momentum along the Fermi surface? And yes. Yeah. So it's, it's not really the Fourier transform of R. No, no, no. Those are very different. Um, well, let's see. Yeah, I mean, it's, there, there's some particle hole excitations. Uh, you know, let me write it down more explicitly. You have uh, some excitation where uh, you create a hole, uh, so P1 and P2. Okay, so you create a hole at P2, you take a particle at P2 and put it into point P1. Um, then this, uh, this R uh, is the Fourier transform of P1 plus P2, the center of mass momentum, uh, the total sum. And the K is just P1 minus P2. Um, so if you create uh, some excitation, uh, it can have a, uh, okay. You're going to subtract out 2KF, of course. 
uh, you only look when you're measuring all the momenta relative to the Fermi surface. Uh, so there's a fast varying piece that you always take out. So K can be quite large, uh, but R is always slow invariant because it depends on the difference of the momentum. Uh, sorry, I, did I say that wrong? Excuse me. I think the minus is. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, okay. Uh, so in position space, what I said was correct. This is the other. Maybe I should think about it that way. Uh, but it's a question of whether your commutation relations have this delta p one comma p two or delta of p one minus comma p two comma p two. Yes, yes. Uh, then it should be a minus and delta sign and a plus in the second. Minus. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to go through that. You can, you know, I could spend uh, several lectures on this, uh, and as I could see, I've forgotten some of this. Uh, but anyway, so uh, any questions from about uh, what we've discussed? Um, so let me also just remind uh, the students that I've been putting up uh, lecture notes, which I actually get updated quite a lot uh, after, especially even after the lecture, when I find a few errors. Uh, so please always look at the latest version, uh, and there are many details that I won't have time to cover on the board uh, that hopefully are usually covered in the lecture talk. So uh, this is if that's really in this indes ind indispensable part of following following what I'm discussing. Okay, um, so I also mentioned an email this morning that I'm going to defer the Lattinger theorem. Uh, because uh, I understand that many students just getting comfortable with Green's function, and that is really quite a uh, uh, technical uh, manipulation of sets of Green's functions. Uh, we're going to need it later in the course, in the second half of the course, and I'll cover it at that time. Uh, so that I'm not going to cover that today. I want to rather get to um, the large U regime of the Hubbard model today uh, on this side. All right, but the last piece of thing I do want to talk about is say a little bit about this collision term. So that's the main thing that, uh, whose smallness is justifies everything that we've said so far. Okay, so to do that, I want to, I will have to introduce some Green's functions to define formally what uh, the scattering rate is. Uh, and I'm just gonna define them and uh, uh, just, just discuss in the general properties won't do any complicated computations with them. Uh, okay. So the best way, at least, to connect my physics, I find of defining Green's functions uh, is to do it in imaginary time. Uh, it minimizes uh, a lot of the technical difficulties. Uh, and it's also formally very rigorous and can be applied to any system. Uh, there's all kind, you know, the usual quantum field theory treatments of Green's function don't work in imaginary time to begin with, uh, and they have all kinds of complicated i epsilons that you have to worry about uh, to make the whole thing well defined. Uh, and the imaginary time formalism just skips all of that. Now, unfortunately, many of the textbooks even in condensed matter are first do real time and then imaginary time. I would just skip the chapter on imaginary time on real time and go directly to the imaginary time chapter. For example, in the book by Bruce and Felsberg or Federer and Valetska. So the basic Green's function, uh, we're going to talk about G of P and imaginary time tau uh, is minus the time order product of C P of tau, C dagger P. So this is a uh, Moving forward in imaginary time with the time evolution operator in imaginary time, uh, which is e to the minus tau h, where h is a Hamiltonian. Uh, and uh, so you can compute this for free fermions. And, uh, and from this uh, Green's function, we can also define the Green's function in frequency space, which is the time integral of this function from zero to beta uh, d tau. Of G. Here, beta is h bar over kvt, which we're just going to replace with one over t. 
All right. There is it the I on the end. Yes, thank you. Uh, and I have to remember the sign of this thing. Uh, so this is uh, easy to be part of it. <laughs> okay. um, all right, so I'm, I presume you, you know, this is one of the background I requested you be familiar with. So I'm not going to go through all these definitions carefully, and, uh, but it's relatively elementary once you have the definitions. Uh, and you can compute it for free electrons. Uh, that gives you some feeling of what it's all about, uh, which is G of P and I omega N uh, is one over I omega N minus E P. All right. Uh, so, so far, this is some very technical quantity that we've defined, uh, not related to anything that anybody can observe because no experiment is in imaginary time. Uh, but we, we are now going to relate it to things we can measure. The reason for defining this is that many of the computations are much simpler in this formulation. And then what you have to learn is uh, analytic continuation. You have to figure out how to take this function and relate it to uh, quantities on the real frequency axis, which can be directly measured. So. In particular, if you compute this G of P and I omega N, uh, you can define it, you can extend it to the entire complex plane. Z, oh, I forgot to mention something, come to that in a minute. And G of P and Z, where Z is a complex number, uh, which is, uh, can be written in the following manner. Infinity, D omega, I don't put a pi there rho of p and omega over uh, z minus omega. Yeah. Okay. Um, so comparing this and this, uh, this function rho for free particles. Uh, rho of p and omega. It's just a delta function, delta of omega minus EP. Okay, uh, so this is what's called the spectral representation. And this is something you can derive for an interacting particle system uh, by starting with the basic definitions there and inserting all kinds of uh, complete sets of states, inserting the identity, uh, assuming that there's a stable ground state and all states are normalizable and have uh, you know, the Hamiltonian is an emission, uh, you can derive all kinds of interesting properties of rho of p and omega. In particular, you can show that uh, rho of p and omega for fermions um, is always positive for all frequencies. Uh, so that just follows from the stability of the system and the existence of a Hermitian Hamiltonian. Okay. Um, okay, so one thing I forgot to say over here uh, is that this brain's function obeys a certain very important property uh, that this frequency i omega n uh, is always an odd multiple of pi t. So it's always two n plus one, n is an integer times pi t. And this simply respects uh, the fermion anti commutation relations. Okay, so, so the imaginary time formulation only gives you the Green's function on a discrete set of points in the complex Z plane. Uh, and really as our task as theorists is to continue from that discrete set of points uh, to the entire for all Z. Uh, and there's some theorems in complex analysis that tell us that that's essentially unique. Uh, modulo some assumptions on the decay of, of the Green's function at large omega, which in fact are like, uh, so if I plot the complex Z plane, then that imaginary time range function I've told you about, uh, you know about it at this, an integer set of points on the imaginary axis. Uh, so this is minus pi t, pi t, three pi t, and so on. They're separated by two pi t. 
And importantly, there's nothing at zero. For bosons, there will be something at zero, but from here on, there isn't. Okay. So there's a question about how do you time order an imaginary time if you are looking at the full complex plane? Uh, what do you imagine the tau, you, you go along the tau axis and you put later a larger tau after a uh, smaller tau. So it's the modulus of tau? Uh, so at the moment, the way I've defined it, tau is always positive. It goes from zero to beta. So yes, yeah, so there's some trickery there. I can even get, since tau is positive, I can just remove the time ordering symbol. So well, what's the point of the time ordering? Well, it becomes important if you want to also apply that formula for negative tau, uh, but that's equivalent to restricting yourself to these frequencies. So once you restrict yourself to these frequencies, then actually you don't even need the time ordering symbol. Uh, so these are all technical details that I don't wish to cover here. Uh, sure. and, uh, okay, but please, you have plenty of, I'm not going to use much of this today, but it's good to just recall this. It'll be useful later in the course. Uh, okay. So really, uh, uh, yes. Uh, I think the question was confusing. Uh, the fact that I think you're extending I omega to the entire complex plane, not tau. Absolutely, yes. I think they thought that tau is getting extended. Oh, I see, okay, yeah. So you can hear Ahmed there, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, we heard that. Analytic continuation in tau is a little more complicated, but uh, I'm just talking about analytic continuation in frequency. Uh, so this, uh, okay, there's some definition of this in terms of exact eigenstates, I won't write it down, which shows that it's always positive. Uh, and in fact, you can measure this. So. Uh, there's something called the photo emission cross section. So you send in uh, uh, light on your favorite crystal, uh, and electrons come out, and you measure the uh, distribution function of the electrons that come out. So this is the original photoelectric effect of, uh, that Einstein had a theory for, uh, which led to, you know, Another measure of the Planck's constant. Uh, so this is done now routinely uh, millions of times a day at various labs. Uh, and this photo emission cross section to, to transfer uh, momentum P uh, and omega, energy omega, uh, is proportional to basically rho of P and omega uh, times the Fermi function. Uh, so of course, and you know, the Fermi function makes sense because you can only uh, eject particles from the system which are present already. So they have to have negative omega. Uh, they have to be in the ground state and they have to give them extra energy to go out. Uh, for positive omega, that corresponds to uh, correspond adding a particle system, not removing a particle. And therefore for very large omega, there is no, no contribution. <clears throat> okay. So from this uh, representation, what you notice is this function g of p and c um, has a branch cut on the real axis. Uh, everywhere rho of p and omega is non-zero. Um, and, uh, uh, and generally for a Fermi system, uh, infinite Fermi system, that's always true. It's non-zero at all omega. Uh, even for even the energies bounded, because they are you know, very high energy excitations that uh, you can create involving you know, 10 particles or 20 particles uh, that are still part uh, of the states you have non-zero overlap with just by adding one pair of particle. All right, so there's a branch cut at all possible energies. Uh, and furthermore, uh, you can also show that G of P and Z in this Z plane as written is analytic everywhere except for the branch cut on the real axis. All right. Yes. Uh, where are the branch points? I mean, are there two distinct branch points for this branch cut or? No, it's, every, it's at infinity, basically. There's a branch. Oh, infinity. So there, it still disconnects sort of the whole. Yes, yes. Yeah. Because if you have a finite system, then there's a maximum possible energy. But if you, because right. there is no mass cap, but there is this. Uh, yes, there's no mass cap. That's, so that would give you a, some branch points here. Uh, because it's a Fermi surface and there's energy excitation at arbitrary low energies. There are also excitations, even if you have a finite bandwidth at arbitrary high energies. Uh, yeah, so, 
Okay, that's kind of viewpoint. That's what bothers you that it goes all the way to infinity, uh, which is totally natural in particle physics. You don't have a cutoff. But even if you have a cutoff, it does go to infinity. But there are many particle extremes. <laughs> um, all right. So it's analytic everywhere, but people talk about poles and other things, which is why I want to carefully introduce what the pole is. Um, so the quantity that you want to measure um, is, say, this quantity, rho of p and omega, because it uh, appears directly in the uh, emission cross section. And it's related to a function that you can define over here, just above the branch cut, uh, which is called the retarded Green's function. Uh, of usually given omega, so this axis here is the omega axis. And similarly, when you come from below the real axis, uh, this is the advanced Green's function. And then you can see from just this representation uh, that there's a discontinuum in the imaginary part, uh, which is just rho. So let's say that the M of G gr is equal to, uh, let's see, I don't know what it is, right? minus pi rho of omega. And if you take the advanced Green's function, uh, it's a plus. The discontinuity on the real axis is 2 pi times the spectral density. Okay. Now, so this is a very general property of any interacting system, uh, but we can see it's not actually even true uh, for the free particle. Because for the free particle, uh, there's a delta function in the spectral density. There is no branch part. Uh, because, well, that's kind of a trivial limit. The moment you put in any interaction, uh, you, that delta function is going to complete, uh, going to become this branch part. So the question you can ask, well, what happens uh, to this this delta function, which you know looks like a pole in G, but I don't see any poles possible, strictly speaking, anywhere in this complex space. So the assumption of Fermi liquid theory that there are some poles, uh, but the poles are in a different Riemann sheet. So what you have to do is if you take GR from say that's what you typically do, you sit in the upper frequency plane, and you don't and you go under the branch curve. Uh, you, you keep analytically continuing GR without jumping to GA. If you use this formula, you would jump to GA. So, so that's the one important technical point that many books just don't even discuss, but it's extremely important. Um, so what you have to do uh, is you can come this way uh, and you extend GR from above here to this GR. And let me call that. So this I'll call GR in the entire complex plane. So what does GR in the entire complex plane look like? Uh, it has a pole in the second Riemann sheet. Um, all right. So let's go over there. So what we say is that G, GR or G analytically continued of P and Z, um, which, okay. Uh, all right, I, have, I should probably improve the notation. Let me call it GR with a squiggle on it uh, because it's the analytic integration of GR from the upper half plane. Uh, that's equal to, well, what we're going to say is as the following form. This is equivalent to the assumption of Fermi liquid theory. Z minus E T so, plus I gamma T. Well, okay. So, yeah, uh, I think that's correct. Yeah, okay. Plus, we call it G inc, incoherent of P and Z. Okay, so in a Fermi liquid, then there is a pole, uh, but it's in the second Riemann sheet. It has a real part EP, 
and an imaginary part, gamma p. So, and so where is this pole? Uh, so now this is the, I'm going to plot this thing in the same complex plane. Uh, so there's a pole here uh, and it's going to look like this. The pole is at, uh, uh, pole EP minus I gamma P. So notice that it's in the lower half plane. It has to be because the retarded green spot is analytic in the upper half plane. They don't have any poles there. All the poles are down here. Uh, and this pole has an imaginary part gamma P and a real part EP. So this EP is exactly the quasi-particle energy. So this EP now in an interacting system is what we call the quasi-particle energy. And the gamma P um, is the inverse of the quasi-particle lifetime, or let's say the QP lifetime. Well, let's see, I write it this way, I always forget. Gamma P is one over two tau P, uh, where tau P is the quasi-particle lifetime. It's really inverse of half the half inverse of twice the quasi particle life cycle. Okay, so so what if what what do we already know? Well, we know that this quantity EP vanishes on the Fermi surface. So the assumption of Fermi liquid. So so it's, that just means that this EP is crossing this axis, the vertical axis. Uh, what's very important, which we haven't established at all. Uh, is that gamma p also vanishes on the Fermi surface. It always has to be positive. And in fact, it vanishes faster than Ep. So the whole assumption of Fermi liquid theory relies crucially on the fact uh, that gamma p is much, much smaller than mod Ep. Um, and we haven't computed gamma p at all. Nothing we've done so far tells us what gamma p is. Uh, so we really have to compute it. But for now, let's assume that is the case, that you have a gamma P that's uh, much, much smaller than ET. Then uh, you have an excitation that looks like a particle. Um, and you also have an estimate of how long it lasts. But you can just you know, take Fourier transform of this and see how various correlations decay. And you'll find that the probability, if you add a particle with momentum P and probability of finding it at the same momentum P, uh, is uh, uh, it decays exponentially, and the exponential decay uh, is e, uh, given the, the time is tau p. And because you're computing the probability, that's what we are producing the truth. Um, okay, and the other quantity I haven't introduced um, is zp. So zp is not something you've met before. Uh, it doesn't appear anywhere in the Fermi liquid theory I summarized. Uh, ZP is what's called a quasi particle residue. Um, and there's no requirement that ZP be large or small uh, in Fermi liquid theory. Uh, just again, from the spectral rules, you can show that uh, ZP is between zero and one. Uh, obviously, for free particles, ZP is one. Uh, so it's positive and uh, it's between zero and one. And there's no requirement that ZP be uh, either be close to one or close to zero for from a liquid three to hold. This is somewhat analogous to when we talk about superfluidity. We have two measures of superfluidity. Uh, one was the superfluid stiffness, and the other was the number of particles in the zero momentum state. The number of particles zero momentum state in helium-4 can be very small, but it's still a perfect superfluid at low temperature because the stiffness is large. Similarly here, in a very strongly interacting Fermi gas, you can get gamma P be very long, uh, but ZP could be very small. Uh, and what ZP is measuring, roughly speaking, is the overlap between a bare particle and a quasi-particle. 
So when you add an electron or remove a bare electron from the system, uh, you do lots of things. Among the things you do is you create a quasi particle. Uh, the matrix element for creating a quasi particle could be very small. The matrix element for a bare electron to create a fully known as quasi particle would be very small because the quasi particle could very has some complicated wave function, nothing like a bare electron, but it has some non zero overlap, and the square of that overlap is zp. So, uh, but once you create the quasi particle, you may have had difficulty creating it, uh, but once you create it, uh, then it, it's perfectly well defined. It lived for a very long time as long as gamma p is small. Yeah. What are realistic values of zp? Well, so they, that varies a lot. So in 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 an ordinary metal like sodium, um, you know, they're on 0.5 or 0.4. But if you go to what are called the heavy fermion compounds, uh, which we'll talk about I mean, again in the second part of the course, uh, where the effective masses are a thousand times the mass of an electron. And ZP will be one over 1,000, 10 to the minus three. So in the heavy fermion compounds, ZP will be very small, about a 10 to the minus three. But in typical metals, it's around one. Um, okay. So what? So how do you measure ZP? Well, uh, so this is where the analogy with the uh, Bose gas also comes in. Uh, the way you measure uh, ZP is by measuring the momentum distribution function, which is also measurable by photo emission, simply by integrating over all energies. So if you measure uh, the following quantity, uh, okay, I don't want to erase this. Um, yeah, so measure n of p, which is just the following quantity c dagger p, cp. Just the number of bare electrons, uh, and let me call it n e of p, to distinguish from the function that I had earlier, which was n zero of p. So I'm going to measure n e of p in an interacting electron gas, uh, but these are bare electrons. So it's very much the analog of the momentum distribution function of bosons that had a delta function uh, at zero momentum. Uh, and this coefficient was the, uh, was the number of particles in the condensate. Now let's measure this quantity. Well, this quantity is just the Fourier transform. And I'll leave it to the notes to figure out which Fourier transform of G of P and omega. Or maybe I should write it out. Yeah, no, I actually have it written out. I should write it out. So you take the green function uh, well on the imaginary axis. That's the way I written it here because that's what we use later on. Uh, T of i omega and p. So we don't put an r anywhere. I mean the actual Green's function with the branch cut on this plane. Uh, so this integral is along this axis. This is a zero temperature. So this sum over these, these frequencies becomes just an integral over omega. Uh, and then you have to put a convergence factor to make this thing well defined. Because at large omega, this decay is one over omega. So this thing is uh, not a well defined integral unless you just remember that the time on this has to be a little later than the time on that. Okay. So, and then there's a d omega over two pi. So when you do this integral, uh, you take this form, which I have erased. Oh, no, there. You take that form, and you do plug it in here. Uh, and now we assume that the G ink would give us something smooth. So we really want to look at the contribution of this. Uh, and so when you do that integral carefully, uh, what you find uh, is ZP times theta of minus EP. Uh, plus a smooth function. So now you combine this information with the fact that this is positive, just by definition, it's the expectation value of oh, this, is, yeah, this operator has to be positive. So this gives us what NEFP looks like. 
the distribution of electrons in the ground state. It's called as one. So it's some smooth function plus a discontinuity. So you have a discontinuity at the Fermi level. Uh, and so there's a well defined Fermi surface. This is PF. Uh, and this discontinuity uh, is ZP. It must be. Yeah. You must assume gamma P is extremely small at the time there's a discontinuity. Uh, well, it vanishes at P equals zero. So yes, um, as a curve short, which I haven't claimed, yes. So what we're going to find, thank you for pointing that out, uh, that gamma P, in fact, this is the next result, gamma P will be of order epsilon P squared. And that's, what, that's why I do this as a parabola. So if gamma P vanishes, then there's a big discontinuity. Okay, so I invite you to just play with these contour integrals to verify that this is the case. All right, so there's a discontinuity, but it's exactly at some Fermi momentum. And so if you measure this, you can measure the Fermi surface. You can just see this discontinuity. Uh, at least at zero temperature, there's a discontinuity. It becomes a smooth function at any non-zero temperature. Uh, this is related to the fact that there's uh, nothing at zero frequency once you go to finite temperature. Um, Okay, uh, and the place you see this discontinuity defines what a Fermi surface is in interacting system. And also, let me just remind you that the number of quasi particles in the ground state, so this is an E of P, what I've got it here is an E of P, which is a measurable quantity. Uh, what's not directly measurable, because we don't know the quasi particle wave function. Uh, is n of p, which I began the lecture with, that looks like this in the ground state. This is, this is what I call n of p. Uh, so without a subscript, it means I'm talking about the number of quasi particles. And the number of actual particles uh, is a similar curve, uh, but you know the quasi particles at all, actual particles at all momenta, because the ground state bump wave function is very complicated, but it still has its memory of a discontinuity at the point. And this discontinuity, you know, has entirely to do with the existence of zero energy excitations. It's due to the gapless nature where the lifetime of the excitations becomes much, much larger than their energy, inverse lifetime. The inverse lifetime becomes much, much smaller than the energy. All right, I think that's pretty much all I want to say about Fermi liquid theory, but the last thing I want to establish uh, is this fact that gamma P is of order epsilon P squared. I have a question here. Yes. So ZP here. Yeah. ZP in general depends on P. Yes. So what you're having the discontinuity is ZP at P Fermi. Not P yes, P thank P. you. Yeah. It's just a complete measure. Function. How do you measure ZP as a function of P? Uh, well, you can only measure, it's only defined. Well, yeah, uh, right. I mean, uh, it's formally is defined as the residue uh, at this pole. So there is a pole, and, which is somewhere in the secondary one sheet, and it's the residue at the pole. So the P and EP uh, and ZP are the same. So you would have to just measure the full spectral function and fit it to a Lorentzian of that form. Uh, and then depending on the fit, you can read off ZP, gamma, P, and P. You have three fit parameters to the, some kind of, uh, you know, photo emission experiment. You can measure N of P, a rho of P and omega, and so on. So, so that predicts that rho of P and omega uh, up to some factors will be ZP times uh, omega minus ZP squared is gamma P squared. So you, you measure this quantity as a function of T and omega, uh, and then you can read off all the parameters here. Can, can we think of ZP as a non-relativistic analog or wave function for normalization? Yeah, yeah, that's what it is, basically. Uh, but but you you here it's finite and there is uh, some kind of unitarity bound on it, this ZP less than one. Yes, you can think of it that way. Uh, I mean, the, the difference here is that, uh, 
if you have any kind of relativistic theory, which is massive, uh, then the gamma p is exactly zero for a range of p up to the two particle threshold or a three particle threshold. Then gamma p is exactly zero. Uh, here, gamma p is never zero except at one point. That's the difference. <laughs> Uh, it's a gamma Hello? system, but nevertheless, it's as if there are particles. Yeah. Hello? In a conformal field theory, ZP is zero. <laughs> when you lose quasi particles, that's the second part of the course. That's all about the case where ZP is zero. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Can we uh, mathematically uh, find out what's the functional form of GP as a function of P, or it just we have to measure the uh, GP experimentally? Uh, well, if you have a way of computing, uh, either with a computer or some perturbation theory or some large N expansion, it's a lot of work, but you just have to basically compute uh, GR of P and Z, or rho of P and omega. You just compute it by your favorite method. Uh, and from that, you can read off all these numbers by fitting it to this form. So, yeah, I mean, there are some simple calculations you can do, even in Hartree-Fock theory. Uh, you can get these numbers. Gamma p is infinite in Hartree-Fock theory. So to do gamma p is a bit harder, but to compute ZP and EP in some simple theory, a mean field theory is not so bad. You can do it. We did it for bosons, and uh, it's about similar difficulty for fermions. Oops, thank you. We had a homework problem to compute various things for bosons. Uh, and this would be very similar for fermions. And I think there will be homework problems of that type. But computing gamma p, is a bit more difficult, and so let me now do that now. Any other questions? I have one question. Yes. Uh, you were comparing um, the Fermi liquid with the uh, Bose superfluid, and um, uh, in a way, you compared uh, the smallness of gamma p as a non-zero superfluid density for the superfluid, right? This is a very rough comparison, but yes, go on. Uh, so um, here, um, um, the actual condition for the Fermi liquid theory to be um, a valid description is gamma p is much smaller than epsilon p or the mod of epsilon p. Uh, there, the superfluid uh, stiffness has, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, absolute meaning, or it also comp uh, compares with some energy scale. Uh, no, it doesn't. So in, uh, for the superfluid stiffness to be non-zero, in the Bose case, uh, you have to break symmetry. Uh, there's a broken <laughs> symmetry, the U1 symmetry. And once the symmetry is broken, uh, then the superfluid stiffness, only then is the superfluid stiffness non-zero. So once it's non-zero, it doesn't matter how small, uh, you are in a superfluid. Uh, so there are, here, it's a little more subtle because we are not, don't have any broken symmetry. So we can't use those ideas. But in some very loose sense, uh, you can think of the existence of this discontinuity as some kind of order parameter uh, for the Fermi liquid. But I wouldn't push that analogy too far. But it's the quantity uh, which, having this discontinuity being non-zero, immediately tells you that you have quasi-particles. Because it requires, uh, it's, that's a precondition. I mean, this, this relation anyway is sufficient. Uh, to establish the existence of this particle. So, and uh, the occupation number of um, the electrons NEP can one uh, is the diagram indicating that at p is equal to zero, NEP is still one, uh, or it can be lower than one. It could be. Thank you. Yeah, there's no reason for it to be one, even at zero momentum. Thank you. Uh, the integral I can into this. Uh, mm -hmm has to be the you know the total density so if you're fixing density then the integral on the white curve and the yellow curve have to be the same okay. okay so uh, let me compute gamma p well i'm not going to really compute it because it's a bit of a mess uh, but the basic idea is actually very simple um, what you really have to do, if you're completely honest in the way I've defined things, uh, you have to go in uh, and try down all the complicated Feynman diagrams and powers of U, uh, and then compute the Green's function, look for its pole, and look for the residue or the imaginary part of the pole. Um, so 
So that's many texts. A few textbooks go through that uh, in some cases. And in fact, uh, in this latter part of the course, we will honestly do that type of calculation eventually, but I'm not going to do it now. Some calculation, sort of like that, because that is, you know, you'll be interested in the latter part of the course on the breakdown of Fermi liquid theory. What happens when these quasi particles cease to exist? And that really ultimately also corresponds to the breakdown of this relationship. Um, and uh, uh, so then we'll have to honestly worry about it. But for now, let's just do an estimate. And the main estimate I want to make uh, is, this, is this law. Where does that come from? Uh, and so what I'm going to do is just estimate it by Fermi's Golden Rule. Uh, that's always the first thing you should do when faced with any calculation, uh, apply Fermi's Golden Rule. So we're going to just apply Fermi's Golden Rule and look at the scattering rate of quasi particles. Uh, without worrying about anything else in just perturbation theory. So gamma P is not exactly that quantity because of this at finite temperature, especially because of these complicated time ordered things that you're computing, which is not directly related to what I'm defining. Uh, but let's just consider the following Gedanken type calculation, which you have some Fermi surface. Uh, and let's just think in terms of quasi particles. So these are occupied states inside the Fermi surface and empty outside. Uh, and you add a particle. Okay, it's going to have some momentum P uh, and some energy E. Oh. Yeah, energy E P. So this quasi particle, what can it do? Uh, well, its energy gets renormalized by all the other quasi particles sitting there, but that's the process that's already accounted for in the definition of EP. Uh, but what's not been accounted for is a scattering process where the quasi particle just ceases to exist. Uh, in fact, it can scatter off somewhere else, some really with large momenta. But the best it can do is lose this much energy. That's only a, a, as much energy it has to give. Uh, so what it can do is it can take a quasi particle which is inside the Fermi surface. Uh, so let me make sure I get all the moment. So there's a yeah, there's a particle here with momentum k, uh, and that's going to go to over here with momentum k minus q. So it's going to get scattered from there and go there. Uh, and now this has to lose its energy, and maybe it will go has to conserve energy and momentum, uh, and so it will go over here. So the P minus Q, epsilon of P minus Q. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this quasi particle is going to lower its energy and it's going to take that energy to create a particle hole pair. So create a hole here and a particle over there. And we just want to estimate the rate for this. So what is the rate for this to happen? Um, so the rate is we'll call it one over tau p, which is two gamma p. At least at zero temperature, that's an identity. Uh, so two pi for the golden rule. The matrix element, well, let's just, it's just u, so we just make it u squared. And we got a sum over all finite states. Uh, so we go to sum over k and q. And we have already conserved momentum. <laughs> So the only thing we have to worry about is conservation of energy, uh, which is that delta of EP plus EK uh, minus EP plus Q minus EP minus Q. And finally, uh, exclusion principle. That's really the key thing here. Uh, that makes it saves the day. For this thing to be very small, you have to just remember that you can't scatter into a state that's already occupied. Uh, where we are thinking about the quasi-particle states, which are also just ordinary fermions, with a very complicated wave function. The fact that the complicated wave function will change the value of u a little bit, uh, but okay, we're just going to estimate this. So, so you have a particle here, we assume is uh, at some momentum p and some energy Ep. So First thing, this thing better be uh, occupied. So that means the probability of it being occupied is F of EK. 
uh, then it's, you're scattering from here to there. So this is going to be empty when you scatter. Uh, so one minus F of EK minus Q. And then finally, you better go into a state that was empty. Uh, so you have one minus F E P minus Q. And that's it. So it's just very elementary application of Fermi's golden rule. Conserve energy, conserve momentum, put the factor of two pi times the matrix on the squared. Uh, and then make sure this is where the many body part comes in. This is really the only quantum part here, uh, the many body part, sorry, uh, which is the Fermi functions. Yeah. Yes. One of those epsilons in the, in the total function is K minus Q. Thank you. One of them should be plus Q. Yes. So I need my process. Yeah. <laughs> E plus Q. Uh, let, let me get my glasses up, but I messed it all up. Sorry. <laughs> um, this one is K, K minus Q. This is P plus Q here. Sorry. Stop. Uh, P plus Q. Yeah. Uh, I think it's okay now. <clears throat> all right. So this, uh, this particle gains momentum Q, this one loses momentum Q uh, and energy is conserved. Okay. All right, so this is still a very complicated integral to evaluate uh, given, uh, you know, you're going to the dominant contribution you can just see from the picture I come going to come near the Fermi surface. Uh, so I'm not going to evaluate it, although it can be done. There are various singularities associated with the momentum integration. Uh, which in fact are very important in one dimension, which is why the estimate I'm going to give you does not work in one dimension. In two and higher dimension, it's generally okay. Uh, and what do you find? So what we're going to say is that, let's just give you at least one intermediate step before I cheat. Uh, So I want to separate out uh, the energy integrations and the momentum integrations. Uh, so I can write this as two pi uh, squared of d e1, d e2, d e3 times some factor, which I will write out in a minute, so the e p is e1 minus e2, minus E3 times F of E1 minus F of E2 minus one minus F of E3. Okay. Uh, this is an integral that you can evaluate, and I urge you to evaluate it, but there's this factor here. And what is that factor? Well, that factor is the sum over K and Q, times delta of E1 uh, minus uh, EK, uh, delta of E2 minus EK minus Q, and delta of E3 minus EP plus Q. Okay, so this is the hard part. This, this object here, still a mess. Uh, <laughs> I'm certainly not gonna do it here. Uh, maybe I've done it once in my life when I was much younger. Uh, but it's some function that of, of E1 and E2, which in the end doesn't change the basic structure of the answer, although it just changes the phase pre, pre, pre factor. So we're just going to ignore this. Okay, there's this factor here, which is this factor here. Uh, we're just going to ignore it. Just very slightly erase it. And we just have to take my word that that's safe in two and higher dimensions. Certainly, say for three and two, also there's a log that we're going to miss. Uh, but okay. <laughs> All right. So now we have to do this integral. So this you can do analytically. You can put it on Mathematica or play around with it. Uh, so I will just tell you what it is. So this integral here uh, turns out to be two squared, of course, times uh, five squared 
t squared plus four or e p equals zero and and e p squared over two for t equals zero. So it vanishes as energy squared. And why does it vanish? Well, you can kind of see, uh, you know, you have the density of states. Um, well, let's see. I don't think about it. Um, you know, just think of how what the phase space is uh, for. Uh, so the delta function will take care of one of the integrals. So you get rid of that, uh, and then this these factors here are only. Uh, non-zero over active over energy window of order t. So you have two integrals over here left over, and that's what gives you the two power of t. Okay. All right, so that's the quick and easy way, uh, really the easiest way to see how this whole thing holds together. Uh, modulo of what we haven't done is evaluate this horrible integral, <laughs> which is, you know, if you have a relativistic dispersion, you could do it. That's what all the tricks are there, but we don't have a relativistic dispersion. Uh, it, the epsilon case vanishes on a circle. Not easy, but you can do it. <laughs> Just put it on a computer. <laughs> what, what, what's the reason for the singularity in low dimensions? Um, because there are singularities over here in this integral. Uh, so in particular, uh, what happens in 1D particular is that uh, there is no continuum of excitations with the momentum Q. If you, if you create a particle whole pair with momentum Q, so you have just linear dispersion like this, and here's your Fermi level, you take a particle from here to here, it has some energy, uh, but if you take a particle from here to here, the same momentum transfer, it has the same energy. So there's a sharp energy momentum relation for creating a particle whole pair. Uh, and that we have to remember when doing these integrals. In two and higher dimension, that's not true. So you can see from here, for example, if I just transfer momentum Q over here, if I go this way, I essentially zero energy excitation momentum Q. But if I do that same excitation here with the same momentum Q, I have a much larger energy. So there's a whole distribution of energies for each momentum Q. And that's not, you know, that distribution becomes sharper and in lower dimensions. All right, uh, good. So uh, that's it for Fermi liquid three for now. Uh, we're going to come back to Lebesgue's theorem, as I said, uh, later in the course. So that really involves you know, some fancy green function technology that you know uh, that I don't want to go into now, and we're not going to need it for anything I'm going to talk about for the next few weeks anyway. Yeah, if we just look at. Excitation close to the Fermi surface, so epsilon p is near zero. Yeah. So the width in gamma. Yeah. Is proportional to d square. At epsilon be equal to zero. But probably also if epsilon is small. If it will be something like square root, it's some kind of quadrature of these two, like square root of e p square plus d square. Yeah. Not the square, more like the sum. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. The sum. Thank you. Yeah, it's it some function. In fact, I think those functions can be computed. Right. So if T is much larger than EP, you're interested in energy. Well, you, you how below T. You take the larger of these two, that's what's going to dominate. So your lifetime is set either by the temperature, temperature is large, or at zero temperature is set by your excitation energy. So of course, yeah, the, the temperature has to be low for the validity of Fermi liquid scheme. You can't make temperature of it. It has to be smaller than the Fermi energy. That's one of the scales that has to be small. But it's, you know, and this is the difference from the Bose gas. Any non zero temperature kind of destroys uh, the perfect behavior. This discontinuity disappears at any non zero temperature. That's not true for the Bose gas. The Bose gas, the condensate fraction can be non zero for a range of temperatures. Again, in two, uh, well, <laughs> two is also special in three dimensions for sure. I have one nice question. Yes, please. Um, 
if I think uh, classically um, uh, in a transport experiment for any arbitrary, uh, even if the lifetime is very large um, and the quasi-particle is expected to die after some time. And if I am uh, uh, talking of transport uh, in a sufficiently large sample, one would naively think that the uh, quasi-particle description should not work. Um, is this uh, correct or um, I'm missing something? Oh, so, so your question is that quasi-particle description dies after some time. Yes, uh, on the quasi-particles oh, must die. What about correlations beyond that time? Yes. Is that probably your question? Yes. Yeah, so, so beyond that time, you enter what you would call some kind of incoherent or hydrodynamic regime. Uh, and this equation, the Boltzmann equation that I wrote down, so in the Boltzmann equation, I had a collision term and a very simple approximation for the collision term. Uh, you know, this is called the relaxation time approximation would be basically delta n of p uh, divided by tau p. Uh, so, which means that uh, everything just relaxes to thermal equilibrium in some time tau p. Uh, and uh, so you can just solve the classical Boltzmann equation. So classical physics kind of takes over um, and, and you just have the physics of a strong interacting fluid which conserves energy and momentum at longer times um, in its collisions. So, so there's nothing, there's no quantum physics left at that point. Uh, but you know, the, the question you ask is a, is a really good one because once you go away from Fermi liquids, say to a, a non Fermi liquid or a form of field theory, uh, that whole question is. Uh, uh, is absolutely crucial because then at this time scale tau p, the time scale tau p which I've estimated is so short that you can't use classical physics at that point. Uh, and so then the crossover to hydrodynamics becomes much more complicated. Uh, and that's in sense, you know, something that the ATS CFT correspondence uh, helps us uh, find models of that. Uh, but here, the time is long enough that at the relaxation time, once you get to this time, uh, you can ignore quantum effects and just use these quasi-classical equations that are So there's a clear separation on where quantum mechanics works and where classical dynamics, hydrodynamics take over. Uh, but in a non-Fermi liquid, there is no such separation. That's of course a topic for later. Thank you. I mean, the quantum mechanics and the Boltzmann equation is, you know, is in these Fermi functions, basically. That's about all. And the values of various couplings, like the value of U and the value of ZP. But beyond that, there is no quantum mechanics. Okay, great. So that's a fun discussion. So, so now let's uh, come back to this. So we've understood something about this. Uh, and let's now go back to large U. Uh, so we'll go uh, all the way to U equals infinity, but, but as we discussed exactly at U equals infinity, and I'm going to focus on right in the middle of this that mu equals uh, as one half. Uh, and here we, we had heard, we, we recall that we had this huge degeneracy um, of n factorial over n over two factorial squared states, uh, because you have to spin up and spin down. Uh, and you have uh, exactly one particle per site. So this, this is two particles per site. This is zero particles per site. There's some kind of insulating lobe here. I've drawn it with dashed lines because we're going to put lots of things in here later. Um, and, but let's just be over here. So the system is, is an insulator because the charges are localized, uh, but the spins are now uh, coming in and we have no idea what the spin state is. In fact, it's hugely degenerate. So what we have to do now uh, is to understand how this degeneracy is lifted uh, in the spin space. Uh, so we'll still be in an insulator. Uh, you want to call it a mod insulator, sure. Uh, but as we'll see, because there'll be some broken symmetries in here, uh, then that's a bit ambiguous, but uh, okay. But right now uh, it looks like there's some kind of insulator that's dictated, certainly dominated by the interaction. It's very different from this band insulator in that sense. 
uh, and has this huge spin degeneracy. So how do we break the spin degeneracy? Well, there's a general technique for doing it uh, called the effective Hamiltonian method. Um, and there are various formulae that you can look up to apply it, uh, but I'll get the answer by a trick uh, because, well, in this case, it's a little simpler and the formula is a bit cumbersome, uh, just like I did that over there too, because use some trick rather than doing a complicated calculation. In this case, that turns out to be good. Um, so the general idea is you have some Hamiltonian, uh, which has a spectrum that looks something like this. You have a whole bunch of levels here. Uh, let's call them the alpha I levels. And then you have a whole bunch of levels here to form the theta I levels. Many more there, uh, which are the gamma I levels. So I runs over some set of labels, which could be different in each manifold. And the different manifolds, the main important point is that the energy level spacing between these, these states is much smaller than the energy level spacing between the different manifolds. So this problem here, when T is much smaller than U, is exactly of that type. Uh, there's a, you know, the states over here, we have exactly one particle on every side. So the spins can be up or down, we don't know. Huge degeneracy, but there's exactly one particle on every side. Then there's states over here, which have uh, exactly one particle, which is doubly occupied, one site that's doubly occupied, and one site that's empty. And everything else is singly occupied. And so on. And the energy spacing here then is U, and U we assume is large. So this will have two doubly occupied sites, this will have four doubly occupied sites, and so on. And you can check at this value of mu, which is u over two, um, that's count that spacing is correct. It's a little different once you go away from particle hole symmetry, but I don't want to do that now. All right, so when you have a Hamiltonian like this, uh, you have some, uh, some states, some eigenstates, uh, which uh, with some eigenenergy E. So what we're going to do is just uh, do a canonical transformation to make life simple for us. So we're going to do a canonical transformation by some matrix U, so U inverse U, and put the U over there. And this is, I haven't changed anything. I just multiplied by some matrix U, uh, and the eigen energies are still the same. But I'm now going to call this my, my new Hamiltonian. So this will be my H effective, which is exactly this. Uh, and then this will be my new states, which I call psi tilde, which are not the same as the original state. I have people forget that sometimes. Uh, and this is psi tilde. Okay. So I'm always free to do this, do any canonical transformation, but I'll do this to make my life simple. And what I'm going to demand. Uh, is that if I take any alpha state and look at the matrix element, uh, this will be the tilde or alpha state. I have to do this rotation uh, in the H effective of the tilde theta state for any J. So this is going to be equal to zero for alpha not equal to beta. If I can construct such a Hamiltonian, then my life becomes simple. This could still be a very complicated Hamiltonian, but my life becomes simple because I only have to look at these states. I don't have to look at the other states uh, because all those matrix elements are zero. So the difficulty becoming then finding just the right view uh, that makes all of these matrix elements zero. So in this problem that can be done, and people have done it to quite uh, high order, you do an expansion in powers of T over U, your H effective, you know, it's something like A zero plus T over U times H one plus T squared T over U squared. Uh, well, there's some that, yeah, times some H two and so on. 
So order by order of this expansion, you can then figure out what H1 and H2 are. H0 is, of course, exactly just this. When T is 0, there is the matrix element is still 0. But now you do a rotation and get rid of these matrix elements. So you're going to project, and this is the kind of thing we're going to do a lot. We're going to be taking our system and projecting it to some low energy subspace. That projection will often introduce new symmetries. And these will be like emergent symmetries of the problem. Sometimes there'll be gauge symmetries. Uh, and, uh, and those gauge symmetries are actually crucial to understanding the physics in these projected subspaces. Okay, um, so this is what we want to do here. Uh, and let's do it uh, for, for this model to order T squared. At order T, there's nothing, uh, nothing interesting. Uh, the interesting term which lifts this degeneracy from extensive to actually you know, one or two or three or something, if you don't have any broken symmetries, uh, that the interesting term comes at order t squared. And people have gone to order t cubed, t fourth. There are systematic ways of generating it, which I don't uh, will not discuss here. Okay, so. The quick way to do this, since you only want it to order t squared, is to just see what happens to order t squared. So you're looking at matrix elements in this subspace. So if you start from here and you apply the perturbation, uh, what's the worst you can do? The worst you can do is take a particle from here, uh, from the alpha space, and move it up here. But then you want to come back here because you're only interested in the matrix element of H effective in here. So you're going to move a particle somewhere. And then you're forced to bring it back at order t squared. And this is t and this is t. Nothing else you can do at order t squared. So what you, what you notice then, uh, instead of doing all this messy stuff, uh, just take two particles and figure out the spectrum of the two particle system. And from that, you can see the structure, which is all we're going to do. But if you go to higher orders, you can see there's other processes. Uh, at fourth order, there's a ring exchange process where a particle will go around the square. That's also very interesting. In fact, could be very important the cube rates, but then it's more complicated to do those calculations. So we'll just focus on two two part two sides. Uh, so if you just take the two-side Hubbard model, well, if I take look at all possible states, uh, each site has four possible states, empty, up, down, doubly occupied. So the total number state is 16. So at worst, you have to do a 16 by 16 matrix diagonalization, but you can use, use a lot of symmetries to reduce it to two by two. And let me just do that here. It's relatively simple. Okay. So we just have two sides, and our Hamiltonian, we're going to get the full spectrum of this. Uh, well, we can get all the 16 states. I'll only focus on six of them, uh, for which have total spin zero, uh, just with two electrons. Uh, yeah, with only two electrons total. So our Hamiltonian is uh, minus p, either the one alpha. C2 alpha plus summation conjugate uh, plus uh, minus mu n1 plus n2 plus u times n1 up plus u times n2 up plus u down. Okay, so we just focus on uh, two particles. So that's the you know, our, our space is space of two particles, uh, and but we want to include all the higher states too. Uh, so focus on n1 plus n2 equals two. And it's easy to see there are six states. So I'll just write them out. State number one, and you see that I got one up, see that I got two up, 
uh, acting on the empty state. Now, you have to remember the ordering is significant. You have to make sure you remember the ordering. Okay, see that I go one down, see that two down, three, which is um, C dagger, one down, C dagger, up, four, C dagger, one down, six, seven, okay. This is up. Sorry, I want to keep the same thing in my notes. Up, uh, top, down, this is down, this is down. And then there's five. Oh. Okay, it takes more time to write them down than to solve the problem. Uh, but anyway, okay, so these are the six states. And these states you see are the nice ones. They're the lower energy because no, they never have two particles on the same side. So they're in the, the lowest alpha manifold. So these have the zero order energy uh, is just zero uh, because this term will exactly cancel that when I'm right in the middle with u over two. And these have energy u. So in this case, uh, the alpha manifold has four states, the beta manifold has two states and that's it. Uh, and we want to get rid of these two states. We want to work only in these four states because we don't want to have to worry about uh, this double occupancy. But for now, we'll just, we're undaunted. We just go ahead and diagnose this. Okay, so now you just look at this and you can see right away a few things. Uh, for example, uh, one and four are already exact eigenstates. Uh, because if you take this hopping term, you move particle one to site particle two, that gives you zero uh, because you can't put two particles that spin up on the same site. So these are already exact eigenstates. So done with those. Uh, then you can also see uh, that if I take uh, two plus three, that also uh, is an exact eigenstate with energy zero. Um, again, you just hit this T and you keep track of the fermion anti-commutation relation, you will see that the T term gives you just zero. We have three states which have energy zero, uh, and that's good. Uh, so now you, you, you notice something that you forgot. You're, you're preserving spin rotation invariance. So these three states are a triplet. This is spin one, both spin up. Sz equals one. This is Sz equals minus one. This is Sz equals zero. So these three states have spin one, uh, and they have energy equals zero. So these states here are S1. Uh, this one and this one and this one. S equals one states in this field. Okay, so uh, what's left? All right. Then uh, you can also do something else. Uh, you can take the anti-symmetric combination of this. So five minus six um, also turns out to be an eigenstate. Again, you just look at. Uh, but this is not a very interesting eigenstate. It has energy U. So we don't care about it. It doesn't couple to us. It's in the beta manifold, doesn't couple to anything, uh, and you're done. So what are you left with? You're left with just two states. Uh, you're left with the state five plus six. So I'll call those states A and B. These are the interesting states to us. Uh, the state A is one over root two, uh, two minus three. So if you look at that, what is that? Uh, one over root two, two minus three. Uh, you notice that it's up, down, minus, down, up. That's a spin singlet, okay? So that's a spin zero state. And this is also, these are also spin zero states. Um, and we want to take five plus six. And you can also understand that by another symmetry that I haven't used, which is parity. Uh, one over root two, five plus six. Um, and these, uh, both of these are um, even under parity. 
because when you reflect one to two, here you just get six. And this one, if you reflect one to two, you think you have a minus sign, but then you have to interchange one and two and move these apart and pick up that sign. Okay, so you have only two states left out of the 16 by 16 matrix. Now you just have to do a calculation. Uh, so, so the Hamiltonian in these two states, HAB, uh, turns out to be uh, zero minus two T minus two T U, uh, because this is a heavy state, has energy U, that's a light state, energy zero, uh, and there's a matrix only between them. So you diagonalize it and the energy uh, is, you only take the low energy state, uh, E low, you don't care about the high energy state, uh, is minus U over two minus square root of four T squared plus U over two squared. Uh, which if you expand it out for t smaller than u is 4t squared over u. Okay, almost done. So what, what the dust settles, uh, I have four states, which are eigenstates of the new Hamiltonian. Uh, there's a spin triplet with energy zero, and there's a spin singlet with energy uh, minus 4t squared over u. Uh, Better be, uh, yeah, there's a typo in the notes. <laughs> Better be negative. Okay, so the picture we have is extremely simple. Uh, so let me just put it here, it's not a lot of time. Um, so in the alpha manifold, we have figured out the exact states. Um, and there's a triplet state here with energy E equals zero. And there's a singlet state here, so this is in one. This has been zero uh, energy minus four T squared over U. So now we want to write down a Hamiltonian. We want the H effective with acts on these four states. Uh, well, it's clear what that Hamiltonian is. Uh, you have a spin a half degree of freedom on each side uh, and the Hamiltonian is J times S1 dot S2 uh, and J it's 4t squared over zero. So what we have seen is that we have lowered the energy of the spin singlet state relative to the triplet state. Uh, this is called the super exchange mechanism for obscure historical reasons. Uh, and the interaction is antiferromagnetic. They like to be antiparallel. Uh, and the reason for that you can already see from here, if they're parallel, uh, there is no correction to the energy. And you know, in second order perturbation theory, you always lower the energy. So in the antiparallel, there is a correction where you go there and come back that lowers the energy by minus 40 squared over U. Uh, and if you diagonalize the Hamiltonian, uh, its eigenvalues are, well, there's a constant here. It's constant. Uh, as you know, the eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian are uh, J over four with spin one and minus three J over four spin zero, and the spacing between them is J, or spin a half. Okay, so for the lattice, uh, the claim is that you will get this uh, 4T squared over U exchange and a super exchange interaction between any pair, any pair of nearest neighbors. So now we have two order T squared determine the effective Hamiltonian, uh, the full lattice Hamiltonian is just, 4t squared over u, sum on nearest neighbors uh, of si or sj. <laughs> and, and this is going to occupy us for a big part of the course now. I'm trying to, this is still a very complicated Hamiltonian, uh, not solvable except in one dimension. Um, and, uh, but a lot is known, and a lot is not known too. <laughs> Okay, stop there. Any questions? <laughs> so we're just at this point. So next time we'll uh, move away from that point over here uh, and then talk about various possibilities, one of which uh, is D-wave superconductivity, which at least in many people's belief, uh, it's quite a bit of numerical support now uh, is driven by this, this kind of interaction.
Hey, any questions in India? All right, great. Uh, so, uh, send me if you have any feedback, and uh, I will see you on Wednesday. <laughs>